Of course. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the Hive. Oh, you didn't break it, did you? <laughs> um, uh, this is the second in the series of the new photogrammetry network. Um, the intent here is to provide a, a broad and diverse focus on people using photogrammetry and 3D reconstruction processing as part of their work, study, or uh, um, other projects. And uh, you know, certainly a technology that can apl be applied in many different areas. Um, so um, we will be um, hosting a selection of these um, seminars. Um, the next one will be in three weeks' time. It will be uh, Daniel Adams, who's uh, running audio and video for us. For those of you online, you can uh, thank him later. And uh, uh, that'll be uh, on the subject of a uh, wreck by the name of the Santo Antonio de Tana, which sank in 1697, 98? <laughs> yes, Daniel says. Um, and uh, um, yeah, so th that'll be coming up after, or in three weeks, oh, yeah, three weeks' time. So um, now I'd like to pass across to Petra Helmholtz, who will introduce our speakers. All right, thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, so I was asked to introduce the speaker, so it's a pleasure to do this. Um, just to, some, uh, to provide some background is uh, a few years back, maybe two years ago, Nick Brown uh, contacted us regarding 3D reconstruction of coral reefs. And Taya, who will be the first presenter, is uh, one of Nick's PhD students. And she will provide a bit of a background of her own work, so I don't want to steal uh, those things uh, off her. Um, but in the last two years, or one and a half years, we had two internships where Liam assessed Taya with the construction of reefs and tried to process the data in this way so she can use it for her research. Um, so Taya is a PhD student. Liam, we managed to get him to be an honor student and he works on this topic as well. Um, but I think all of the very fancy stuff I'll leave up to the two um, in order to, to run you through that. Yes, thanks a lot. Taya, I think I'll hand over to you first. And then... Thank you, Petra and Andrew, um, for the introductions and for having us here today. Um, I will just introduce myself quickly and then Liam, and then I'll get into some of the kind of um, background context around my project and why we're here and why this is important. Um, so I'm a PhD student at Curtin um, researching productivity, growth and resilience of the turbid coral reefs of the Dampier Archipelago. And I'm supervised by Nicola Brown and um, Jen McElwain here at Curtin as part of the Reef Ecology and Island Futures Lab and co-supervised by Richard Evans and Sean Wilson at the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. And my project sits under a broader DBCA offset project, um, investigating primary productivity and energy transfer between marine ecosystems in the Dampier Archipelago. And this project also involves students at UWA, Murdoch and ECU, as well as researchers at Ames in Townsville. Uh, Liam, did you want to introduce yourself? Oh, quickly, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, so good day everyone. Uh, I'm Liam Boyle. Uh, as Petra said, I'm an honours student in a Bachelor of Surveying. Uh, so just about finished my degree. Um, so I started my first internship helping Talia uh, in the summer of 2021. Uh, I started off in January, finished uh, just before the semester started. Uh, we looked at a couple of things, mainly uh, calibrations of the Canon G7X camera that we used in terms of stability, make sure it's actually suitable for what we're doing in the work. Uh, also worked on some GoPro calibrations, uh, which I won't be discussing today. That's a bit off topic for this. And some productions as well to lead on to Epoch 2, which is my second internship that I did at the start of this year, so 2022. Uh, further calibrations, um, comparisons, make sure everything's still working good. Uh, refining the method that I've used, more productions, and of course, uh, the actual key to all this was the actual growth analysis of some corals. Um, so for, I like to thank the DBCA for the first internship, uh, which is really nice, and Kurt EPS for the second one, and Petra and David Belton uh, for supervising along the way. It was really good. So I'll pass back to Talia and she will continue on. Thank you. 
All right, so coral reefs are recognised as some of the most diverse and productive ecosystems on Earth, providing a range of critical ecosystem services, including food and habitat for a range of organisms, which drives local diversity, as well as providing invaluable coastal protection by dissipating wave energy and supplying sediment for beaches and other habitats. However, coral reefs are under increasing pressure from local stresses such as pollution and reduced water quality and global stresses that include extreme weather events and rising sea surface temperatures. So corals provide the physical and functional foundations of coral reefs and so um, coral reef resilience is largely dependent on the function of individual coral colonies and how their functions scale up with community composition and ecological interactions. Corals obtain energy through autotrophic sources, so that's a transfer of energy from their uh, photosynthetic symbiotic algae, and heterotrophic sources, um, so that's through uptake or capture of dissolved and particulate organic matter from the water column. And these energy sources are influenced by environmental conditions, including uh, turbidity, so how clear the water is, which influences the light available for photosynthesis, as well as suspended sediment concentrations um, and water temperature. And that energy is then used by the coral for things like growth, reproduction, immune defense, and response to environmental change. And so by tracking coral growth over time, particularly as growth rate, we can use this as an important indicator of coral reef health and productivity that can be easily measured using a variety of established techniques. Um, so here I've just put up a few examples of some of the more traditional measures of um, coral growth and calcification. Um, so the first picture here on the left um, is just an example of some direct like linear measurements, so in situ, or we can also do that from bird's eye view photographs, um, or uh, following skeletal staining, which is the fourth picture there. Um, and otherwise we can also look at um, assessment of annual density bands from x-radiography of cores, um, or use this buoyant weighing technique of um, small coral samples, which that's the most interesting picture I could find of that, but basically you put a coral in a bucket and weigh it. Um, so many of these methods for measuring coral growth can be quite labor intensive, um, destructive, limited to certain morphologies, or they can introduce error if they're not replicated properly. And uh, photogrammetry can provide a highly accurate, repeatable, non-destructive method from which a range of other useful metrics can also be extracted in addition to growth rate. Uh, so the use of photogrammetry on coral reefs has increased markedly in the recent years with about 80% of all coral photogrammetry studies published since 2015. And a wide range of metrics can be extracted from photogrammetry outputs including growth rates, uh, surface area, volume change, reef complexity or roughness. And that makes this approach a really useful tool in the study of coral reefs at a range of spatial scales. So from like the individual coral colony scale um, all the way to the reef scale. So just to give a quick overview, um, my PhD aims to assess coral growth characteristics and physiology across the turbidity gradient in the Dampier Archipelago to improve our understanding of how these processes support coral reef resilience. And specifically the photogrammetry components of this, we're looking to quantify coral growth characteristics across this gradient and then more broadly map coral productivity across the Dampier Archipelago. And then as Liam mentioned um, in his introduction, he's had two internships that have um, kind of fed into this as well. Did you want to talk about that more or happy for me yeah, to move on? Yeah, on. cool. So the Dampier Archipelago um, is comprised of 42 islands off the Pilbara coast in northwest Western Australia. Um, and the reefs of the Dampier Archipelago have comparable coral cover and diversity to the Ningaloo Marine Park, which is located about 300 kilometres south. Um, the coral reefs of the Dampier Archipelago have shown um, resilience to acute and chronic stresses, um, including um, from industry, for example, from dredging, port operations, um, intensive recreational use, and also um, cyclones, periods of high turbidity, and anomalous periods of high water temperatures. Um, however, the 
I guess the coral cover doesn't necessarily follow the expected environmental patterns. And so that's why we're interested here to kind of delve a little bit deeper into what is driving that resilience. And so as part of my project, we're tracking coral growth at 10 sites across the archipelago. And for Leon's internship, um, he has used images from three um, sites, which are the ones circled in red just there. So the data collection, this is the fun bit, or the not so fun bit on the first field trip where we were still trying to figure out um, how everything works. But essentially when we get to the site, um, we set up in about a 10 by 10 uh, metre area and work within that area. And we've uh, identified five colonies of each coral genus. So we've got three of the main reef forming morphologies. In this case, we've got the Cropera, Parietes and Turbinaria. Um, and once we've found our five colonies of each genus, we um, tag them with cattle tags and then also um, a permanent control point. So in this case, we've used um, anchor screws, like a heavy duty like bolt screwed into the reef um, so that we can be confident that hopefully by the time we come back next year, um, they'll still be around and we can find our corals. Um, we also in the field um, take a GPS location and then make a rough kind of mud map so that when we come back, we can find the corals. And we have been back, uh, three times now and we've been able to find them all or some of them have been damaged and that sort of thing but we've had pretty good success there. Um, once we've set up the site, firstly we've uh, photographed the calibration cube and so that basically involves um, using, just in this case we're using um, the Canon G7X, just standard camera. Um, and we photograph the cube in a series of arcs to make sure that we have between 50 and 60 overlapping images there. Um, once the cube's been photographed, then we place the scale bars around each coral colony and photograph those in a similar way. Um, and I guess just depending on the environmental conditions, we would be looking to make sure that we have as many photos as possible that include the scale bars and the permanent control points and then also more photos where the water quality is, or the turbidity is worse so that um, we've got more photos to play with. And yeah, so the data for Liam's internship was collected in November 2020 and March 2021. And so that captures the summer growth period of about four months. Okay, so... Oh, cool. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. How's that? Real good? All right. So, at the start of my internships, uh, of course, we do a camp camera calibration. Uh, so why would we do this? We need to understand how the camera's performing and if we can do that, we can better tailor that to the images we have. So I guess the end re result of this would be we're trying to reduce our errors in our productions and get a better result at the end. So for all this we're using context capture, that's what we use uh, at Curtin here, so that's what I'm very familiar with. Uh, and we do a manual calibration. Now there's two different types, manual and automatic calibrations. A lot of publications through my reading use the automatic calibration uh, through different softwares. I've opted for a manual calibration mainly because I wanted to control what was going on. I want to pick out what points I want to use and how many photos and then I can also analyse it as well. So we've got the frame here, it's a 53 point frame uh, in two levels. Um, the height change is good for this as well and when we do our adjustments. And all 53 points are in a local coordinate system, which we can feed into context capture. So the kind of workflow we're looking at is we'll import our photos, we'll do an initial adjustment just to set things up, we can do a quick little uh, check of reprojection, uh, and then we go import our control points, define the coordinates, and then we pick out the points we want. And between epochs I did change my method, and I'll get to that in a second. So we allocate our points, we then run our final adjustment, but we adjust for all parameters. And then the result of that, we get a quality report, and then we can check several components in that quality report, uh, including overall reprojection, and then our errors associated with our control points that we've selected. And 
between the, well, I should say, within those uh, control point errors, look at things like uh, distance to raise uh, RMS errors, uh, 3D errors, and the like. But the one thing I'd mainly like to focus on is our radial lens distortions today, because it's slightly easier to show. So we can see on the right here, uh, here's our uh, overall plot from the two years that I've done this internship. So three of these are from internship one. So there was one calibration per location. And four in the follow-up. Uh, we had two for ELS. And that'll become quite important in a second. So I guess the main thing about radial lens distortion is what we're looking for. We're looking for a graph that is increasingly negative the further you are away from the image center. Um, so I guess that in itself is really good because you want to analyze something you want to be quick and easy to see. So you can see right away that, well, all our calibrations have done this uh, exactly how we expect. And then we can see that it is ELS number one. is quite different towards, uh, or in, in comparison to our other ones, at about four and a half millimeters, you can see it start. Its uh, errors are less than everything else. So I identify this as most likely an error given that all the rest of the calibrations tend to end up roughly in the same area. And we do expect some differences because after all it's, it's underwater photogrammetry and we can't have it exactly perfect. So we, we allow a little bit of slip uh, in our calibrations. So like I said before, we had two in that case. So ELS1 I've ignored. I've classed that as likely some sort of error in the calculation. And we had the, the backup one of ELS number two to use instead. So I, I was happy with that result. So overall, all of our calibrations were really good. And this then leads on to our actual productions. So this is what we, our main productions were point clouds, but you could do meshes and ortho DSMs and the like. So I guess the general workflow is very similar to what we use in our calibration. So we're still in context capture. So we're going to import our photos and importantly apply the calibration that we used for that particular one and then we fix those parameters so the software knows exactly how to adjust it and we'll reduce errors in the end, hopefully. So then we do, so that was an initial calibration and then so before we had our coordinate system for our control points, now we're just gonna use simple tie points. So I'm just telling Context Capture, this is where the point is in so many photos and then it's gonna put it together. So in this case, you'll see here on screen, we got uh, the cattle tags and nail points that Charlie was talking about before and a couple of scale bars. And I'll talk about the differences between epochs and how I went about that. So you would select your tie points in however many photos you want to use, run your adjustment, and then you get given a quality report. So I'm gonna quickly talk about the differences between my epochs. Of course, when you do the first run of something, it's not always how you want it to be. And this is no different. I wasn't too happy with how I did it the first time, so I improved it. So what I've done is, I went to five tie points in my second epoch, and I always made sure I referenced the scale bar. Uh, and this will be important in a second when I come back to it. But then I've only used one nail point. So on the example on screen, if I took the scale bar with a compass on it as my four points in the, uh, in the adjustment, I would then go down to the middle nail point as my fifth point. And I do this because I don't want to clump all my tie points in one corner uh, for error reasons. I, I'd rather things spread out a bit more. So that was my choice for this one. So in terms of analyzing our output through the quality report, uh, basically the same as what I did before. So in this case, I can't do a radial lens distortion. But what I can do is we'll look at the reprojection, uh, distance to rays, and the scale constraint estimate. Because I use the scale bar um, as a fixing tool. So as you can see on screen, we've got a few numbers that we try to work with. So reprojection, hopefully less than three pixels approximately. Distance to rays, hopefully less than two millimeters. And in this case, I've only got the one scale constraint. I'm looking for a zero or perfect scale. So if we look to the table here, we can see that we've pretty successfully done this. Uh, you'll see that the distance to rays are occasionally a bit higher but they're not to the point where we're saying uh, this is complete rubbish and we've got to redo something. Um, like I said, when it's underwater photogrammetry, we can, we can let it slide a little bit. And two millimeters is still perfectly fine. Two and a half, three, close enough. Uh, and all our errors are really good. Um, zero for that. 
if you were to use two scale constraints or three or an etc you do find the errors start to be a little bit one way a little bit the other way just because you're trying to fix two points the same distance and an adjustment can't always get it perfect so that was really good to see so that was just epoch 2 um, i would show the other ones but this takes up too much room but overall all our production uh, quality reports are really good and so we can move on to the next stage of the process so it's a bit more what I did before. So Epoch 1, I went from four, four points to five tie points. Uh, like I said, I was using mainly the nails before, and then I changed that. And I guess the big difference here would be how many photos I've used. And I probably should mention before my calibration as well. I was clicking a lot of points in my first internship, and I'm only one person, and it was taking a very long time. So I made the choice to go basically 50% less. Um, so we're looking at probably 10 or so points per type point epoch 2, uh, which is still plenty sufficient. Uh, the main benefit when you start using more photos is your distance to rays tend to be slightly smaller, uh, but the keyword being slightly, it's not that much of an improvement. So I guess I'm looking for more output rather than sitting there for hours and hours clicking points. So yeah, rationale of this entire thing in epoch 2 was save myself time, but don't ruin the results of Tyler's PhD pretty much. All right, so I guess this is the, uh, the really important bit is the actual growth analysis. So a lot of this method can be related to a study in 2020. There was a, another visual before from Lange and Perry. And it's very similar to what I've done, except I've slightly tweaked things to how I see is more appropriate for what we're doing. So I'd like to quickly touch on what I changed and why. So I guess the immediate thing was You've got to bring your two point clouds in to cloud compare. And cloud compare is what we're using for this, I should say. Uh, it's often used by publications. So you've got to bring your two point clouds in, but you need to align them. And there's a couple of ways to do that. There is the quote unquote rough alignment, and we do this through point picking. So that's again where these nails come in. Uh, we assume that they're in fixed places and they're not changing through time. So we use those. There's normally three or four of those uh, per colony site. And then in the study from 2020, they have decided to, after that rough alignment, actually manually tweak it themselves uh, to match uh, the rock forms. I've decided against that purely for the reason that I wanted to quantify how, quote unquote, poor my alignment was. And we'll soon see towards the end, actually, it's a lot better than you think it would be. So that was the first thing I changed. The second thing would be uh, the trimming, which is pretty minimal. I've just done it after the alignment, so everything's trimmed the same way. And uh, we're looking to trim as much of the excess uh, as possible. We just want to leave the colony uh, as best we can. It's probably not as crucial with this sort of calculation because I'm manually picking the points. Um, but there are different sorts of corals where you apply different sorts of uh, methods of determination. And if you start to leave uh, the non-colony point cloud data in there, you can uh, reduce the effectiveness of your uh, calculations. And then in the study from 2020, they used 10 points of extraction for their growth rates. Uh, I've used 12, uh, not a big difference, but 12 just works out really nicely for this. So as you can see, I've gone for four center points in approximately the sort of middle area uh, of the colony, and then eight external points where I've just sort of roughly divided it, uh, there's no real science to it. Uh, that's one of the biases that I'll get to as well. So apart from that bias of where, where in the world do I click on this, is also where exactly on the branch do I click? So for an Acropora, it's a branching coral, so typically the growth is all towards the end of the branch tip. Now, I can't say with 100% certainty that I've clicked exactly where the branch tip is, uh, but the good thing is for the most part, I can say I'm really, really close and that I might be introducing uh, maybe even sub-millimeter errors, millimeter at most, which isn't really the, the biggest uh, worry in the world for this sort of thing. We're looking at predominantly centimeter growth rates. So, yeah, so sectioning, uh, where I click, and then let's have a look. I guess we'll go straight to the results, I guess. So you can see in the top right corner, we have the six colonies that I've worked on. 
uh, the number one and number two for ESM Acro one were two colonies of the same type, just in close proximity, so we just, they were done at the same time. And we'll see that later when we have some visuals. Um, so yeah, so we've got an average of six centimetres per year uh, with a standard average error of 0 0.21 centimetres, so we'll say two millimetres. And then just for some sort of comparison, uh, I took this from Pratchett et al. 2015. They did a sort of summary of all types of different uh, growth rates of corals. And from Talia, we took a guess of what was the most applicable one. So these are two different methods based on true annual data. Uh, one of them, I believe, was from the 1970s, and the staining one was much more recent. That was the last sort of 10 years. So I guess if we took the average, which might be slightly off given that you've got some old data in there, we'll say it's 4.6 centimetres per year. So if you compare that to our average, we're quite ahead of that by a significant amount in terms of what coal growth, or at least I would say is a significant amount. Um, but let's say the older data is probably not so trustworthy. Um, we'll take the, uh, the 5.28 centimetres per year from staining, and we're still like, noticeably ahead. Um, so we can say the method is pretty good overall, I would say, um, quite reliable. However, as we've said before, our data set only belongs to three or four months worth of, um, of days, so 114, 115 days. And of course, we start scaling that up we've taken into consideration the summer period of growth, which should be more. Um, I would expect that to drop down uh, maybe a couple centimetres, maybe, at the most. I don't really know until I process it, I guess, but that's just a rough estimation of what I would say. Um, so, yeah. So I guess the end of this is taking with a pinch of salt. Um, but so far, it's quite promising, and the technique has definitely, definitely got some go when it left. So I guess no project goes smoothly, and this was relatively smoothly, but there were some things that happened along the way. I guess the first thing we've got to consider is water, and that it's not always clear. And I guess when you're dealing with photos, that's kind of what you want at the end of the day. Um, if you don't have clear photos, especially in this sort of software, it starts to quote unquote struggle, I would say, in terms of uh, uses a matching process. So if you look to sort of the, the left-hand image here of the calibration frame, you can see it's a little bit murky in areas, probably not as bad in this one, maybe towards the top right hand corner, it gets a bit unclear. Um, so yeah, so that can degrade results in the end. Uh, I haven't seen anything so bad that I haven't had something that didn't work out, uh, but touch wood for that. Um, so I guess apart from image quality, another general thing they had to deal with was uh, appropriately adjusting my method. I didn't want to go about just changing things willy-nilly. Um, I made sure that what I changed was for good reason and that the results reflected it. Um, so for the calibration frame, I actually went from 53 points down to 12 points, which is a significant change. I also reduced my image count by a significant amount, um, over half, much like the point production as well, I went from 100 to 50. Um, it's all about saving time, but not sacrificing your results. Um, but I was happy with what came out of that, so that was really good. Uh, I did have some issues with some scaling, uh, just for Epoch 1, uh, Epoch 2, that was all resolved. Um, but the good thing is, of all the mistakes I had to make, uh, in Cloud Compare, I can scale things as I need, and we can use the scale frames in the actual uh, Point Cloud data set to check and bring things more into line. Uh, you do tend to find that you can't get it exactly right, because although you have a dense Point Cloud, you do find that the scale points, you're missing some center points, so it's very tricky to get um, exact measurements for that. But there are other distances that we know on the scale bar, so overall, that's not a big deal. And then, I think it's always good to, you know, pick out what errors you can quantify. So go back to what I said before with the alignment. If we look to the top right, you can actually see how well, good our rough alignment was. So ENS Acro 3 and ENS Acro 5, they did require some scaling in the first epoch. So that's why they're slightly worse. But if you look to the ESM uh, point clouds that I've worked on, where I've used the exact same methods and I knew they were scaled properly, looking at sub-millimeter alignment, which I think is really, really good, probably better than I'd expect. Um, I think it was better than what um, the Lange and Perrier were experiencing at the time. So that was really good. So. That's why I will continue to use rough alignment until I see another reason not to. 
And then, I'm, so I'm really happy with what's been happening. Uh, the results are really good. So I guess going forward, my calibration method, I can leave that, or forever who does that next. Um, I think it's very well optimized. Uh, an argument could be said that I could have used more photos in those, but from what we've seen, the graphs ended up all quite similar. And then from a production standpoint, even though I'm happy with what I used in terms of tie point allocations, I probably could have done a little bit better. And so my recommendation going forward would be to potentially even use two scale constraints off two bars and probably get rid of my two points of the internal bars. So you may have seen before where the bars came together, there's a horizontal section. We know that's 158 millimeters, but when you start clicking it, it's not always easy to get it exactly right. It's not like hitting the center of a circle. Um, so that introduces some minor error, uh, but nothing too serious in the grand scheme of things. Just some minor nitpicking on myself. And I guess you go back to the, the very start of things, is that to always check your data set. So you may see in the bottom right, I put these three, three visuals together. So you'll see in this scalar field, and the scalar field derives our growth rates. That's the difference just between point clouds. I should have mentioned that before. Um, you'll see this top section, and it looks like the same sort of coral. And then you go to your RGB color, and an argument could say that it's pretty close. But then you look at the actual image from the field, and it's clearly something else. Um, so that, that was a very uh, close mistake that I made. Um, and there's also other data sets where you might have uh, the two colonies in the same set. Um, so it's always good to check what you have before you start doing anything serious to make sure you're not making an extreme blunder. So I guess that wraps up um, my side of the internship. A lot of method and not too much in the results, but I'll leave the results to Talia, I guess, at the end of the day. Uh, so thank you very much. I think we're going to go into some visuals with some goggles, I think. So yeah. <laughs> Goggles, glasses, whatever you like to call them. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so once you have your glasses, goggles, if you want to call them, uh, you should see the number 13, that sort of QR code thing. Okay, if you can see it, that's good. If you can't see it, let me know. So I'm going to... So-so, not quite. <laughs> Okay, so these are the point cloud productions that I've made uh, for the five uh, colonies. So let me see. So the two left ones are the one from ENS uh, location and the ones on the right are from ESM. So you can see that there's no, you know, you, you might expect like a sort of a square rectangular output from, from the production, but no, it's quite random. And you will see points that are just not modeled um, due to visual constraints or whatever it might be. Um, but the main thing is the center points of your point cloud are always quite dense, and that's the important thing, so we, we can do our analysis. So let me see, oh, if I can go a little bit closer. Ooh, I'll go into this one here. So you can see, once you get quite close, it's probably not as dense as you might expect. Um, that's all right, it's perfectly fine for these sort of analysis. So you can see that the sides of some of these corals are quite different. And this is something I should have mentioned before, but we found that these smaller corals do bias the result. Um, because what happens is these smaller corals, they grow more evenly across their entire body instead of these larger ones. You may have seen before that the larger coral had a lot of growth uh, towards the perimeter, but not a lot on the inside. So what you get is those central values start to bring down that average, whereas these smaller corals, oh, oh that's not right, oh, there we go. Forward, yes, there we go. These smaller corals, they grow really well towards the center. In fact, their central growth is probably as large as their perimeter growth. So that is 
a slight bias in the results. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to jump to... So after trimming, I get something roughly like this. Of course, normally these would be uh, over the top of each other, and then we run a scalar field uh, calculation to get our extractions. So, do, 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 do. Oh, all right, we're going to get up. Okay, so this is the sort of output we get from our scalar fields. And so, just what I was talking about before with, if you just look to that specific center coral there, uh, coral colony, you can see, if I can go a little bit closer, uh, that, uh oh, haven't used this in a while. Sorry if this makes you feel a little bit queasy. All right, that's not working like I want it to, but you can kind of see what I'm talking about, and maybe more so to the one very on the right. A lot of that central growth is really large. But if we look over to the left, you can clearly see, like the second one in from the left-hand side, obviously that central growth is nowhere near as big as the uh, primitive growth. Of course, the white and red areas are the ones of maximum growth. But that's the sort of output we get uh, from this sort of process. Uh, it's, it's quite effective, and that's why it's being used a lot more in not just coral and reef research and the whatnot. Uh, it's also applicable for UAVs and the like. Um, so yeah, that's what we're looking at. Um, are there any questions about any of this? <laughs> Yes, Ian. So, um, well, first of all, well done to Natalia. Um, I can see how it works coming, so it's pretty good results. But how would you be able to kind of quantify the kind of effort and time? Because obviously, I realise it's a bit just more sure There's a lot of setup time, but going forward, doing this kind of work towards time, and what kind of the time constraints on this, or how long does it take to kind of do this yeah. collection and processing? Yeah, definitely. So, like, just get back to Eport One. Like, that took a serious amount of time. We're talking, by the time you click 53 points in a frame across, like, uh, 30 images per point, you can see like, it quickly adds up, and you do that for multiple calibrations. It did kind of drive me insane, which is why my Epoch 2 was so different, and I wanted to take away a lot of that time. So, just for Epoch 2, you can probably do a calibration in, in less, well, I'm going to say an hour. This is a nice number to say. Um, maybe uh, 10, 15 minutes for your analysis by the time, like I had an Excel spreadsheet set up so I just chuck my numbers in from my quality report and that tells me that radial lens distortion and you can see pretty quickly if, it's, if something went wrong or not. And of course you've got error tables you can check as well. Um, so that's the calibration side, we'll say an hour. And then productions, maybe slightly longer, I'll say an hour and a half, uh, roughly. I didn't really keep track of times. Um, this is off the top of my head from four months ago or something like that. Um, so yeah, so two and a half hours by the time you made your production. That's one production as well, so you've got to take into account your epochs and the like. And then in cloud compare, you might look at an hour, uh, roughly. Uh, depends how well it goes. It doesn't always go super smooth, especially when you start scaling things. And your first scale is never right, so you've got to check it, then you've got to scale it again uh, and get it as close as you can. Um, and then you've got to think about uh, if you went and started and clicked, clicked more points on your point clouds, uh, it all adds up a little bit. Um, so, Just yeah. Adding to that thing as well, that's something that I think we'd like to include as part of like, my work as well, so some sort of like um, measure and, you know, saying, yeah, this took this amount of time. And I think as well in the Lang and Perry paper, they had um, a bit of a summary of how long each step of the process um, yeah, so how, how long each step of the process takes and obviously as well, even with the field collection, um, that was kind of a refined process that when we went out in November 2020, it, we spent the whole field trip setting up those three pilot sites and then when we came back in uh, March, we were able to do that a lot more quickly because we knew what we were doing and where we were putting it and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that we'd like to kind of include in this work as well. It's like an assessment of how long that takes and then, you know, as well, um, what we're getting out of that in terms of reducing error. Um, um, so, 
that you could click on the screen about 50 different times? Are these are key points that you're looking for? Yeah, so that frame, those white points, that, they're the ones with the local coordinate system, so that's what I reference. Um, Some of that may be coordinated for like, You can do, and that's what the automated ones tend to do that. In fact, the automated ones, uh, softwares, they don't even tend to have a calibration frame. They can just do it based off the images. Um, yeah. And, and Tyler, on the data collection, um, uh, it's a challenging uh, environment to work on with the very set mm -hmm. did, did you, did you I think, were your methods for the photography changed between, as you saw it, was there anything you can advise recommendations or, you know, how you changed about kind of collecting those pictures in, in such a challenging environment? I think as well it became a lot easier to kind of change that in the field once I had a better understanding of what actually goes in on the processing side. And so realistically at the end of the day it's it's how many photos can you see those tie points in. And so if the image quality is too poor then we need to take more photos to be able to see those points in enough photos. So I guess when you've either got a much bigger colony or the visibility um, is reduced, I was tending to take, uh, I guess, m maybe even up to double the amount of photos um, just to make sure that when, by the time we come to the processing stage, we've got plenty to work with. And, and uh, when you see those pictures in, in, in the field, do you imagine them to, what's your feeling when you see the, the results of your models, you know, how do you feel in terms of your PhD, do you think you're going to get what you want? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it's pretty cool to be able to see even just this short-term amount of growth um, with the Acropora, which is a faster-growing coral, and that's why Liam focused on that for his second internship. Um, and, you know, the results that Liam showed, they are within the realms of what we'd expect for that um, genus. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it will be a really... Um, interesting thing to keep moving forward with and this growth um, data will then help inform where we want to do some of these more in-depth physiological um, experiments as well to look at, you know, how the growth changes with environmental conditions and what sort of factors are really driving that. mentioned that if the, in some of the images were too degraded, do a second time, take more photographs, right? But what about those that are not too degraded, but you know, did you apply any pre-processing step in order to clean them up so you can use them? Uh, we didn't personally, but I think that that's something that um, other people have been working on in terms of even just like colour correction, that sort of right. thing. Um, but I guess in this case we found that, that the images have been fine. Um, I guess for, we didn't necessarily come back in for a second dive and take more photos, it's just kind of when we get into the water, if the visibility is a bit worse than some of the other sites we've been at, that's where I would just adjust and take more photos there. But um, yeah, it's not something that I've been working on personally, but it sounds like there are people working in that space, definitely. I guess to quickly add to that too, in context capture, it does an assessment of the image as well. It'll tell you, oh, I couldn't use uh, this many set, and it'll actually pick them out for you as well. So I guess that's part of when I was talking about like an initial adjustment and then a final adjustment. That initial one tells me, oh, I've got a bit of a problem going on here. Sometimes the control points and the tie points, depending on what um, part I'm working on, it can actually clear that up. So sometimes I've had uh, like five or so images uh, flag. I've actually had them come clear just because I've actually told it some parameters of what it's kind of looking for and then it just solves it. Um, so yeah, that's another thing you can kind of rely on a little bit, um, but yeah. It's probably a good segue to the, the Daniel's talk, I think that might yeah. look like um, Did you want to just give a little overview of the next talk, or? Yes. I'll show you a Cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Yes, so three weeks' time, we'll be meeting here again for the, uh, uh, a talk by uh, Daniel Adams, as you can see on screen here, sitting up the back at the moment. 
on photogrammetric 3D reconstruction of the Santo Antonio de Tano shipwreck, um, which sank in 1698, um, using legacy photographs, photography from the 1970s. Um, so it's, uh, um, you know, they, they captured photographs of this wreck, which is off the coast of Mombasa in Africa, in the 1970s. Um, uh, with the intent of doing some advanced processing on it, but they never intended or thought that it would come to this level. We've been able to generate a full 3D model of the uh, hull as it was sitting in the, uh, on the, uh, I think it's the River Delta before um, it was excavated. Um, uh, so that'll, that'll be in roughly three weeks' time on the uh, 20th of May, um, and uh, it'll be in here. Um, It'll probably be a face-to-face -face session only. Um, so uh, um, hopefully you can join us then. We've got a few more talks in the works and we'll announce those as they come up. A few people in this audience we'll be um, looking at to, uh, to present as well. Um, uh, for those of you here, um, I've got a few other um, interactives or uh, props to, to be able to show you. This is a new camera. Um, it's based on a camera we developed um, recently that um, uses a, a Sony camera internally. Um, the first iteration was a titanium-based housing which goes down to 6,000 metres. A little bit heavy and a little bit expensive. This is a plastic version, um, only 1.4 kilos um, and uh, um, is suitable for 300 metres of water depth. And we've got a couple of projects looking at using on, that on shortly. Um, so that we've got, uh, we've just had two of those made up. So we're, we're gearing up to get those uh, um, being used offshore. And um, another camera, which I may as well just bring across. This is this looks a little bit of a Frankenstein. But this is an array of Sony cameras in a in a in a a vertical arrangement. This is also using the Sony RX0 cameras. Uh, these are the Mark 1s. What we've got in the new cameras are the Mark 2s. But we've got five cameras arranged here just in the process of getting things connected together. But the intent is that you'd be able to walk around an object and capture lots of photographs all at once. Um, the software we've developed here allows us to interactively um, communicate with the cameras via the uh, USB connection and download them in real time to the computer um, so that uh, um, potentially you could capture uh, um, you know, an object five times as fast. It doesn't necessarily have to be this spacing, so we could have a, um, a, a different rig with closer spacing for um, uh, smaller objects or perhaps a bigger spacing for bigger objects and we could potentially even have you know, um, an array of them, you know, multiple stands like this. So I've just got this attached to a, uh, a lighting stand just to provide stability but um, you know, it's, it's, it's light enough to, uh, to just, just hold like that. So um, you're welcome to have a look at both of those. Um, so uh, thanks again for attending, appreciate your time and uh, thanks again to uh, Liam and Talia.